I am a human being and I kill human beings. Before Neil Todd fired four shots at the door, I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. Kill human beings. In a country where 70 murders happen every single day. These are the stories that reflect the stark realities of life in South Africa. Welcome to Profiler Africa on YouTube. I'm Paul Llewellyn. Thanks for being here. Always that little moment at the beginning, Gerard. <laughs> if you haven't already, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. As always, I'm joined by Jared Labaskachny. Uh, he is, of course, a former law enforcement officer and current head of LNS Threat Management. From 2001 to 2016, Gerard led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service, working on over 300 cases of serial murder and rape. He's also recognized internationally as an expert in forensic psychology, and he is simply known as the Profiler. It's been quite the week, Gerard. Know what's been on my mind? What's been on yeah, my mind has... this week are the... Sorry, uh, I, I got, I'm too excited to talk about our, our week. Um, <laughs> what's been on your mind, Gerard? Um, well, quite frankly, the upcoming holiday, but um, I oh, did uh, yeah. definitely enjoy some of the interviews we've done recently, which um, I'm sure our guests are going to, our viewers are going to find out more about. Absolutely. We recorded two episodes for the Christmas period this week. We did, first of all, with uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Jan de Lange, your great mate, uh, talking yep. about the Anisha van Nieker case, which is such an interesting case. Um, some really great uh, forensic work in that case. It's really interesting, quite unique. So I think everyone's going to love that. And also to get to see that, you know, the, the dynamic between you guys having kind of worked so closely together over the years. And then, of course, we recorded just last night our um, Jared Labaskachny and Mickey Pasturias in conversation for the, for the very first time. And it was just, I mean, I, I must be honest, Gerard, I did not feel qualified to jump in much on that conversation. So, guys, if, if you're, a, if, if, first of all, if you're a true crime fundy and you want to see, I mean, two of the greatest minds in forensic psychology in the world in conversation with, with each other, you've got to tune in. Or if you're a fan of me shutting up, then um, it's also a good reason to tune in for that. Hey, that yeah, was a great, uh, great conversation, and it was what's nice. I think, which hopefully the viewers will like. <clears throat> you know, we didn't talk about a case. We talked about what it was like to be doing this job, how we both got into it, and little bits and pieces, pieces, funny moments, you know, interesting things. Yeah, and of course, one or two cases beyond the big memorable ones that that stood out for each of us. So. Uh, I think it's a nice little back, back story or back insight into people who are doing this kind of work that I think the viewers will enjoy. And hopefully the first of a number of conversations. I mean, uh, Mickey has got her uh, YouTube channel, um, Profiler on Record, which you must go and check out, guys, and like and subscribe. We're all about supporting our African true crime community. Um, and, you know, you guys are speaking about the potential of you going and uh, joining her on her show as well, which would be exciting. So I'm, I'm excited to hear part two of the conversation, hopefully. Absolutely. Any, so let's carry on with tonight, though. I mean, there's lots to look forward to for Christmas. And like I said, and we are really trying to kind of put together some really nice content so you can binge watch a bit of Profiler over the holidays. Tonight, though, we focus on the case of Susan Road, a woman whose death was initially presented as a suicide, but it would go on to reveal a disturbing story of manipulation, violence, and ultimately, well, hopefully, justice. We're going to find out tonight. Before we start, mm. make sure you're subscribed to the channel and uh, drop a like. Uh, it, of course, helps us to keep bringing you in-depth local true crime content. Join the live chat and share your thoughts or questions. We'll certainly be uh, pulling up some of your questions and comments in the course of the episode. So, uh, Please do take part. To help us continue our work, consider becoming a friend of the pod on uh, Patreon or signing up as a member on YouTube. 
Membership gives you access to some exclusive interviews and other content. Super likes are also very welcome and go a long way to supporting the show and we'll give you a shout out during the episode. And then, of course, don't forget later tonight at 9 p.m. Central African time, tune into True Crime Room with Derek Reedley, who's covering a shocking murder, initially thought to be a case of Muti murder, but the truth might be far more complex. It's a story you don't want to miss. It's a very South African story, and perhaps you'll learn a bit about what Muti is. We won't talk about that here. You guys can tune into uh, True Crime Room straight after um, straight after our discussion. It's premiering at 9 o'clock, and then it's available on the channel for you guys to watch at your leisure. Okay, admin done. On to tonight's case. Gerard, mm. tonight we're taking folks to the beautiful city of Stellenbosch, um, mm. Stellenbosch in the Western Cape. If you've not been, I mean, you know, people talk about Cape Town and the Western Cape, the, you know, the wine region down there, and it really is just some of the most spectacular natural beauty in the world. I mean, me and you even spent a, some lovely time down there together filming, uh, filming documentaries, uh, in yeah. particular shooting interviews on this particular case at one point as well. Yeah, Your I mean, reflections absolutely. on Stellenbosch, Gerard. Yeah, it's as you said, it's a beautiful town, very scenic. It's kind of like always was regarded because obviously Stellenbosch University is there. <clears throat> so that is kind of was always regarded as the Afrikaans Harvard. You know, Stellenbosch was the place to go. That's where the future leaders of the country went to, etc. Um, and of course, it was recently in the news for a few, you know, hazing kind of things with regards to to students and some of the in some of the. Um, hostel accommodation for the university. But I mean, I, over the years, worked on quite a few cases down there. We had an unsolved series of child murders, little children who lived in the sort of informal settlements, cooled enough around um, that area. Uh, I obviously, as cops, we, Yanni and I used to love going down there to work. Sadly, it was always because of some tragedy, but you know, we would stay on a wine farm and you know, it's just, it's just really great place to be and to visit. But like many of these little places that have a beautiful side, there's often, you know, a sinister side. We had even um, uh, Inga Lotz, of course, that uh, murder of that young Stellenbosch student many years ago. <clears throat> the boyfriend was charged with the murder and then ultimately found guilty. And of course, the cops, some of the cops in that case really did some, some horrific work that was not on par. Um, so, that you know, the town has had itself mentioned. Uh, I think recently also there's some students that were kidnapped and murdered by some, mm. you know, local guys so uh, the name pops up there in terms of crime fit with fair regularity yeah i just and you know you mentioned a number of student incidences you know folks may not realize it's a student town as well so it's a very kind of typical traditional south african student town um i knew stellenbosch you know i'm a Rhodes student and, and my knowledge of you know my initial kind of knowledge of stellenbosch was that they could drink more than the Rhodes students on the <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that friendly rivalry <laughs> but anyway it's a beautiful part of the world and a place you should get to but um tonight of course we're going to be delving into something that happened at one of the wine farms there in fact it's one of the well-known wine farms called spear wine farm but before before but but before we get into the nitty-gritty of the case and talk through the kind of chronology of what happened what was it that was interesting about tonight's case for you jared you know broad strokes yeah. So this was in July 2016, and I left the police in Feb 2016. And I mean, if I'd been there, this this would have been one that we were would have been involved in. It had all the elements of this sort of psychological murder or psychologically motivated crime. We had staging, which is something we often commented on and got involved in. You know, you could have done it, which I think they should have done. The state should have done a psychological autopsy, which the defense did try to introduce that. And we'll get into that in a, in a few moments. Um, and again, what was phenomenal I mean, you had great legal representation, um, but you had terrible expert witnesses. And if the, the judge slammed um, basically, I think, three out of the four expert witnesses uh, for, this, for, the, for, the, for, for the defense, uh, they just did like quite horrific stuff. And the judges uh, will probably read some of the snippets of what the judge said. And the yeah. stuff that you as an expert witness, you never want to have your evidence described as unreliable. That's literally meaning that you're just honest that you're not telling the truth. And that credibility finding stays with you. So the next time you testify, if, if somebody knows about that previous um, sort of determination by the judges, you being unreliable and being dishonest and not truthful, um, that can be raised the next time you testify in court, especially if he, specifically if it's a judge in the high court as opposed to a magistrate making that finding. 
Absolutely. Okay, great. So we'll unpack some of those aspects then as we go and the folks will get to kind of really get yeah. your insight into that. I mean, you do a lot, you do, you do a lot of work as a, you know, in court, um, you know, as a, as a witness. Um, so it'll be great to get your insights into what the do's and don'ts are there and what is really frowned upon. Um, I just want to say hi to some folks who are, who are watching. Denise, Louise, is it MB, Marius? How's it, guys? It's lovely to have you guys on the chat. Hello. The Van Breda murders also happened in Stellenbosch. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's just right. outside of, yeah, yeah, kind of, I guess, the yeah, greater yeah, Stellenbosch yeah. here. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we've got Monique joining us from Birmingham. Hi, Monique. Okay, great. So we've got some people joining us. So let's, um, okay, we're going to now then go to 2016 is when the case kind of really starts. Yeah. And we're going to we're gonna meet up with a family. We've got Jason and Susan Road. They've got, they've got a few kids. Seem to be a, a nice middle class family, um, oh, or upper upper, upper class. class, upper middle class. Okay, cool, great. Um, but yeah, there's 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 issues, there's tensions there. What are those? Jack? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they've been married for twenty years, as you said. They've got three kids. Uh, two of them were a, a twin. I think that's the, the correct way to say it. And we don't want to obviously get into their names and details, uh, yeah. obviously to respect their privacy as far as possible uh, under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, they lived in Johannesburg. So the crime occurred while they were down were there for uh, a, a work, one of his work functions that she insisted on going, going to. So this is visitors to Stellenbosch. Um, they actually lived here in, in Johannesburg. Um, and basically, things seem to start to unravel about two weeks after Valentine's Day of that same year, where unbeknownst to um, Jason Ruder, our accused, in the, eventually the accused in this case, his person that he was having an affair with, I can't recall exactly how long, um, had slipped a uh, Valentine's note, I think, into his bag. And um, Jason Ruder's wife, Susan, discovers it about two weeks after Valentine. And that's like where the whole thing explodes. That kind of leads to them both having their own th therapy sessions and then couples counseling together. Um, and those people, some of them were brought into the court case late, later on. And, and really, I mean, it, understandably, I mean, look, there's always two sides to every story. And it's very simplistic to say you had the affair, you're the wrong one. You know, mm -hmm. relationships fall apart and people withdraw love and attention. And sometimes that causes people to seek stuff outwards. Yes, you know, ideally either fix it or leave before you do that kind of stuff. But, you know, things are never as straightforward. So I'm also not going to sit there and say, judge him for that he was wrong to have the affair, et, et, et cetera. Yeah. But anyway, um, this, of course, is very traumatic for her to discover and really struggling with the whole issue and struggling to get over it and, you know, wanting to go to all the places that he and she had been to, the, 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 the lover had been to. This, oh, I guess she can kind of like print her own memory uh, over over those areas and what exactly do they do and those those kind of details that eat you up I think if you're ever sort of on the receiving end of, of, of an affair for, on one of your partners um, and but she really did want to stay in the relationship you kind of get the impression as you read and listen to things that on the one hand he wanted to not break up the marriage and have the family but also wanted the relationship I guess you can say wanting both you know your candles on both ends so to speak mm -hmm. um, which is also wrong you know I think if you're not interested in the marriage and you feel there's no way to fix it then leave and allow, allow both both parties to move on sorry that's just a little psychologist uh, in, in, <laughs> throwing in a few words there um, i'm sure the comments might disagree and that's kind of how we fast forward to them eventually coming down um to uh, to spearwine farm as you know i think it's been around since 1692 it's now very much a conference facility the wine farm is still active but it's a conference facility, and there's wonderful accommodation. You can stay there even if there's not a conference, and there's restaurants, etc. A very beautiful setting. And um, he didn't want her, Susan, the wife, to come down with him. I think for obvious reasons, he was the, the, the lover, uh, Jolene, was going to be there. She was also an estate agent, just remembering that he was quite a CEO of... Um, Oh, which which is a very big estate agent. It's something, something Sotheby's. I think they merged. Okay. Um, and so he was obviously one of the big people down there for this event. And she insisted on coming. She knew that the lover was going to be there. And even with her psychologist, she had discussed, you know, what am I going to do if I see her? And how am I going to handle that? Should I confront her? And, you know, they, she, she brainstormed that with her, with her therapist also. And that's kind of how all these role players Jason Roder, his wife Susan was down there because normally you don't bring partners to these events, but she kind of insisted on it. And of course, the lover was also there as she was an estate agent for the same company. 
and kind of then things sort of unraveled uh, sort of over the, I think it was the Friday night or Saturday night, 24th of July, uh, and then into the early, early hours of, of the morning when the body was discovered. Okay. Um, we were just looking at some images there of Spear Wine Farm and actually the, the, the part of the, the estate where the actual murders happened. Um, all right. So, so the body is, so like you say, there's, there's this tension. Um, we're at Sunday the 24th, early morning. Um, it seems to be when the trouble, I mean, this is happening in, in the, in the, yeah. in the middle of the night kind of thing. There, really, there's, there's conflict. Yeah. So, so um, the, so the night before they'd been to the, I think to the, the function, I think she had actually, I don't know if it was the night before or a previous night, but she actually had sort of walked up to the lover and said, um, oh, you must be so, you are so-and-so, I'm so-and-so, I hope we never meet again. So nothing, I guess kind of just her wanting to, uh, understandably so meet and confront and 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 um knelt down in front of the lover and she and she actually then whatsapp or spoke to a therapist about this and the therapist was like how do you feel now and she says no i feel good but at some point on the night before the murder um you know he he wanted to go out obviously to meet up with her and there was a big fight about that and then eventually does go to this to one of the rooms where three of the estate agents including the lover is there um, then the wife sort of comes to the door and insists he has come out and, and there's arguments about that. And mm. so it does, things do get heated. Um, she's obviously not believing now that I think then also she discovers some messages, I think if, if I recall correctly at night in question between the two of them. So, yeah, I mean, just again, I just all around, I think horrible thing for the, for, for Susan to have experienced, um, while you're there, you're realizing this, this thing isn't actually over, yeah. um, and just yeah, I mean, I mean, I can only imagine it's gut wrenching um, to be in that situation. So shortly after eight a.m. or around eight a.m., mm -hmm. Jason claims to find that the bathroom door is locked in mm -hmm. the in the apartment that they're staying in, and he calls reception for assistance after about twenty five minutes. And then shortly <laughs> after that, a handyman arrives um, to find the scene. Should we, at this stage, should we jump to the actual? Um, I see we've got some uh, some security yeah, going on in the background oh, there as well. <laughs> always happens when you buy something. No, um, exactly, exactly. It's fine. It's just he's just making sure that the uh, the crooks are staying away there, Gerald. Um, so, so sh what I was thinking was, should we jump in and look at some of what 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 he would have been confronted with when he walked into the room, and actually jump in and look at some of the crime scene yeah. photographs? So, um, okay, so here we are. Um, and that, that is how you spell the surname. And a lot, a lot of people spell it R-H-O-D-E, almost like Rhodes, but it is R-O-H-D-E. So it's not uh, just for the readers, that's not a spelling mistake. Okay. So here we've got an aerial view of the estate and then we jump in. Okay. So bedroom first and foremost. What are we looking at here, Jared? And just any comments on kind of, you know, evidence gathering, you know, the process of taking photographs of a, of a crime scene as we look through these. And I'll just kind of click through them as you prompt me here. Yeah, so of course the, the police have to be called out to any unnatural death. So even if it was, this was undoubtedly a suicide, there's a suicide note and you know all the, all the elements that maybe would maybe would point towards a suicide. The police have to come, the police have to do an investigation, they have to gather evidence, they have to prepare it to eventually go to a magistrate. So any unnatural death in the country is fully investigated, almost as if it is, I guess you could say, a murder. So what we've got here is these markings that you see. B is now obviously labeled for the bed. I mean, that not B for bed, it just probably happened to be, you know, A is usually the, the actual body and B would be the next exhibit. So what you're seeing here, those other spots and splotches were, were blood. Um, and then also on the, there on the pillow, you can see they've circled it with the, with the, with the, uh, they made sort of circular markings with the pen. Um, that, if I recall correctly, was mascara. Um, okay. Of course, one of the hypotheses later did, you know, he try and smother her with a pillow, uh, et cetera. So we're looking at basically blood and mascara. Um, and there was also, I don't know if we're going to see it, places where there was feces um, on uh, the floor, but not, if I recall correctly, in the actual bathroom. Okay. So here are just some more shots of the, some close-ups yeah. of the aspects that we were just looking at. So you see, this is the but, mascara and, and, you were talking about. This is the yeah, and, mascara. Yeah, and, and the, the two de detectives were called out, I think that's feces. Okay. If I recall correctly, the detectives that got involved in this case, one was uh, uh, Apollos uh, and the other one was, I think, Adams. And I actually have known them from previous cases that I worked on um, uh, in the SAPS. And if I recall correctly, we're quite you know, competent 
uh, competent investigating officers. Um, okay. And they would have been attached to the Stellenbosch detective branch. Where is Susan at this stage? Well, obviously, you know, the thing is he phones the reception, not saying, I think my wife is locked inside. He's just like, oh, I can't unlock the door. Uh, sort of quite casually, if I recall correctly, from the trial record. And, of course, the whole trial judgment, which if you ever want to really get a good summary of a, of a criminal case, um, look for the judgment. Because the judgment will summarize what each witness says said and, of course, what the judge or magistrate thought about that witness. You know, do I, did I, do I find this person credible? And if I don't, why not? And then kind of brings it all together into what the evidence was that allowed them to find the person guilty. So if this is available. I don't know if we can post it somewhere for either Patreon or whoever you, Paul, you can decide. Yeah, so let's do that, it's yeah. 175 pages of the judgment, which will really summarize everything. That's a really great, um, a great place to go. And that's where we're getting a lot of information. And that's always better than newspaper reports, because I can guarantee you, newspaper reports, man, my experience, if you're, you're lucky if the information is 50% accurate, even if that journalist was sitting in the courtroom, it's just phenomenally how wrong they get things. So definitely try and always get the judgment. Not all judgments are typed, unfortunately, but um, it'll typically more your high court case, but also like the appeals. So some of the appeals that happened after this about the, the sentence and about the length of the sentence, those would also be um, sometimes available in, in what we call SAFLI, S-A-F-L-I-I, which is a website. Do you put a lot of that down to the fact that, you know, the press are really trying to cherry pick the kind of sensational aspects in particular? You know, it's not even that. I would find that they, they would just factually get things wrong. I mean, I would remember okay. I would be testifying in a courtroom and the next day I'd read in the newspaper about my evidence. I'm like, I don't think you were sitting in the same courtroom as me because, you know, that is not exactly at all what, what mm. was said. Which is why often when I would testify, I would have one or two extra copies of my report available or at least on email that I can forward to a journalist because I'd rather have them get me quoted correctly than that what they hear and what they write down. Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, yes, they don't, they don't often understand court proceedings. They misinterpret, they mislabel words and terminology, etc. Okay. All right, let's go back and look then some, at some more of the crime scene photos. So here we've got the passageway. And um, we've got a black bin bag here. Yeah. Um, again, I think it could have either been feces or blood, That, uh, if okay. I recall correct. And, of course, you obviously put everything into a forensic bag and label it and then document it. And then the chain of evidence has to be collected. And who handled that exhibit? Who handled it next? Where was it stored? When was it handed over to forensics? Who received it? So you have to have all that we call chain evidence yeah. Uh, and if you don't have that, a piece of exhibit might be rendered not admissible in court. Do you think that the evidence, that all of this evidence they would have pulled is sitting somewhere in the Western Cape? Do they, uh, you know, are our, are our storage facilities and our kind of live, you know, uh, archiving facilities, are they, are they pretty, um, pretty good? We, oh, well, look, I mean, so things like the, the, the blood sample, the DNA, sometimes you might, in the old days you'd cut that out the, out the bed spread. Nowadays they usually would just swab it and then send it off to forensics who then process it. And they might keep that actual physical swab for a period of time, but your evidence becomes the DNA results you get from the swab. Um, okay. So that kind of stuff can often be destroyed after a period of time. If it's a physical evidence like a weapon, that might be the, at the end of the trial, the, 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 the prosecutor can make a decision as to what must happen with that exhibit. You know, must it be destroyed? Must it be handed back to someone? Um, things like that. Okay. We um we jumped a slide, so we saw the the last one we were looking at was the shot from behind the bathroom door where you see some cords hanging off the bathroom yeah. door. When the when the handyman was called out, then where did he find Susan's body? I believe she was in the bathroom. Yes. Or, yeah. yeah. So Jason Rudd basically called him, said, "I can't open the the bathroom door." And as many of us know, if you go to a hotel, you know, if you look on the outside of the bathroom door and the handle, uh, this is sort of the handle, my pen. And, then, and then with the handle, with the, the turning point of it, there's that little circle. And there's often like, looks like a slit where you can stick a screwdriver or a coin or a edge of a knife. And you can actually unlock the door from outside. And that's really all this, uh, this handyman did. And he kind of opened it and uh, then noticed, uh, I think if I recall correctly, since he noticed a pair of legs sticking under the basin. And that's, I think, when Jason kind of pushed his way in and then saw his wife um, basically against the, the back of the door. Uh, and we'll try to jump to that slide now, but she had what appeared to be like a curling iron or a hair straightening iron. 
um, around the neck, um, which was described as not being particularly tight. And then it was attached to, as you see, one of the, the, the sort of hooks that you would hang on, the, hang the, your shower. And that's not a very thick hook. Um, mm. You know, those little screws that go into the door are probably like really, really tiny. Um, mm. So she wasn't completely suspended. And that's not, so, that's not uncommon. You know, a lot of hangings, you're not dangling with your feet off the ground. A lot of hangings are what we call partial hangings, where either your foot or your knees are on the ground. Because you don't need a lot of pressure around someone's neck. To, to die as a result there. I think something like two pounds or two kilograms worth of pressure is enough to cause someone's death if it's applied to the neck in the right way. So you don't have to be fully suspended. Your neck isn't breaking in these kind of hangings. You know, judicial hangings where you drop, you know, when they pull the lever and the floor opens up, that potentially can break your neck. But usually it's other mechanisms that are causing um, your death and usually very, very quickly. People think that, you know, you, you're dangling for four minutes until you stop. Oh, sorry, Jared. My bad, my bad. Okay, it's live. These things are going to happen every now and again. I'm also, for everyone at home, I'm pressing, I do all the driving here as well. So uh, every now and again, <laughs> I knock the wrong button. Sorry about that, Jared. Carry on. Yeah. So, so she was found sort of, it's either she was sort of sitting down partially or crouching down, I think is the one description. Um, but she's basically found behind, dead, essentially behind, uh, behind the door. Okay. Then what? I mean, what is, what is, What's the story? I mean, what's Jason's story? When, when is, when, you know, who is, when is Jason first quizzed on what's gone down here? Well, well essentially, you know, he's basically saying that they had the argument and then he went to bed and she went at, in the very early hours in the morning when they finished arguing. And then he woke up and she wasn't in bed. And then, as I said, she was eventually discovered. So he did say that there had been the sort of arguments earlier in the previous evening, kind of along the theme of what we've described. Police, obviously, as I said, are deployed. Now, it's good in this case, <clears throat> and very important, and I really wish detectives working on unnatural deaths would do this all the time, is that the, patho the forensic pathologist, the person going to do the autopsy um, or the district surgeon in a smaller town, um, is almost never called out to the crime scene or the death scene. And that's really, for me, such a huge mistake that there, there's always a doctor on standby to come out to the scene. And it gives that doctor a much better understanding of what to focus on in the autopsy the following day when the autopsy is done. So luckily here, uh, Dr. Khan, who was on duty, a forensic pathologist, uh, did come out uh, to the crime scene or the scene of death at this point in time to do an inspection of the body in, on in situ, you know, on, on, on the site. And that's very often also important if you want to try and determine post-mortem interval, how long someone's been dead for. You can't do that once the body's been refrigerated because our bodies typically go refrigerated in your autopsy the following day and there's, there's a religious reason to do it immediately. So the only way you can really determine cause of the time period is um, if the person actually comes out to the scene, they'll often take, you know, make a slit and put a probe into the liver and get a temperature from deep inside the body uh, and they'll measure the ambient temperature, is the air con on, uh, the circumstances of the room. But also you just have a better understanding of what to look for when you do the autopsy if you were, you were at the scene. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they're doing that autopsy without that information. And as we know from our research, detectives tend not to go to autopsies, shockingly so. Crime scene yeah. experts don't go to autopsies, shockingly so. I mean, is that also got to do with the fact that though it's just a just a workload? I mean, you know, do we do, isn't it just that we just don't have enough personnel to be able to attend... You every know, there's, scene the, and every autopsy, or is it? Look, it's not as if they're going to like doing well. And anyway, if you had five bodies that come in today, they're all going to be autopsies tomorrow. So you'll got to oh. sit there for five, six hours, or however long it takes. But okay. um, you know, the thing is that no, the, the autopsy is kind of like the crime scene. Once it's done, it's done. You can't oh. go back to. It. So you know, you might go there thinking, "Oh, this was a suicide." And imagine this. The situation, you go there and you see, oh, you know, suicide looks to me like a suicide. I'm not going to go to the autopsy. But tomorrow at the autopsy, the doctor says, but this woman, like in this case, didn't die from a hanging ligature. She died from manual strangulation. Okay. Now, if you're not at the autopsy, when are you going to find that out? And you're not investigating a murder. So maybe six weeks later, you go pick up the autopsy report and it doesn't match the crime scene. Okay. That's is that great. is that how long it would take you to get your hands on the autopsy reports? I mean, are they? Yeah. Is there easily. a delay before they're available? Very easily, up to a couple of weeks. Yeah. No, wow. no, for sure. Okay. So, but if you're at the autopsy, you're there. You know immediately. Or what you thought yeah. was a stab wound, 
might turn out to actually be a gunshot wound. So you don't know you're looking for a gun until you go back and get the autopsy report. But if you were there, you could say, well, geez, I've got a possible suspect. Let me do gunshot residue on his hands. But if you think it's a stabbing, you're not going to be doing that. So it really is. And it just it freaks me out and makes me so angry when detectives think, oh, I don't like doing that or it's unnecessary or why should I do that? And then if you're asking that question, you should not be investigating deaths. Yeah. You should not. Go, go investigate stolen cell phones. Um, this is part of the parcel of the game. You go to the crime scene, you go to the autopsy, you interact with your experts. Um, otherwise, you're just a shit detective, to put it very plainly. There's no way to get so, around that. So these are the, the fundamentals you can't get around. Simple yeah. as that. If you're a soccer player and you, you decide that kicking the ball isn't going to be part of your thing, you're not going to get on very well. <laughs> I don't like dribbling, so I'm not going to do that part of it. It's like, no. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, so autopsy's done. They, they, they do the autopsy, they, the, and, and that does take the case in a, in a different direction, I gather. When, well, well, when, even, even at, sorry, Paul, even at the crime yeah. scene, the pathologist was saying, this isn't okay, adding up. Okay, okay. So, that, so it's not as if for a couple of days they thought this was suicide. I think kind yeah. of from the crime scene, things just weren't adding up. The pathologist is going, nah, uh, uh, this is not, you know, what I'm seeing here isn't matching what I'm seeing biologically um, on this body. So now we have to start think about things like staging of the crime scene. Yeah. He, Jason had handled her body, is it? Um, he'd actually, prior to anyone arriving. Um, if I'm trying to think quickly, well, prior I know to the kind of authorities arriving, another friend arrived uh, who was, I think, part of parcel of this uh, event um, and started doing CPR. So I think they did CPR. The friend, I think, did CPR for like up to 45 minutes while waiting for, the, you know, I think everybody else to, to finally pitch up. So, you know, that, of course, is, that complicates things a little bit because you almost always, if you're doing CPR, you will break bones. Okay. And also remember, the body is a crime scene. So, and I think if I recall yeah. correctly, Jason did also help and participate, uh, if mm. I recall correctly, in, in okay. that initial. He, did, he definitely, I think, was seen holding her, you know, as he kind of went in and saw the body. And so he was handling the body to some degree. Okay. Um, I'll just bring up the next slide. This was a statement from uh, Desmond Daniels, who was the, the, the caretaker that arrived. He states, I'm an adult man um, and work as a handyman at Spear uh, Vainland Hut. I hereby declare on date I was approached by the sergeant who asked me to demonstrate to him what I observed on the morning of 2016. It was 7.24 and I was called to him 2021. I explained to the following to him is in my statement dated I was called to room 2021 at about 8.15 because the bathroom door was locked. I opened the door with my screwdriver. When I opened the door, I saw the legs of a white person as indicated in the photo. So, so that was what he came across. And then this was just him demonstrating his um, entrance into the, into the bathroom. And also just to add to that, the way she's found, she's essentially naked except for like a spear robe that's sort of sort of over her shoulders in fact i think it was desmond or someone else said they actually thought it was a towel around her shoulders so it wasn't like it was nicely you know pulled pull on her and they're, the, they're basically describing the how the the cable kind of looked okay okay yeah. so uh, Miss, and he says mr road passed me into the bathroom and i remained standing outside the door mr road called me <coughs> to come and help him and i when i went into the bathroom mr road picked up the wound in front of his chest with his arms under her arms, and there was an electric cord around her neck, like in the photo. And this is kind of what you're talking about, the pathologist starting to go, uh, stuff's not adding up, is it? Because if this is what the cord looked like, it is very loose. Is that, is that what yeah. we should be looking at here? Yeah, and then he's noticing also, um, you know, bruise, some old bruises, like five to seven days on her legs, and I think upper thighs, some more fresh bruises, some injuries to the body. So looking like something had happened of an altercation. I think this, that was another thing that was pointing towards him going, this is not adding up. And of course, it's not the job, though, of the pathologist to classify it as a, as a murder or not. That's not in South Africa. That's not like a coroner like you have in America. They do make a determination on whether this is a murder, accident, or suicide. Okay. South Africa, the forensic pathologist really is there to determine what caused the death, not is this murder, accident, suicide, uh, etc. Okay, okay. All right. What's next then, Gerard? 
And so the office of the crime scene is processed. Um, you know, they did have people like Marius Hubert, I think he was a captain at the time from the forensic laboratory, highly experienced uh, biology crime scene person um, who came out to obviously do some of the, gather some of the evidence. Um, and essentially they'll be packaging the evidence, waiting for the autopsy report. You know, would there have been enough to arrest him at that point in time? No, um, I, I don't blame the cops for not doing that. Uh, even if the doctor's, thinks this thing looks dodgy, you're not going to go arrest based on that. You want the autopsy done. And then once it's, you know, confirmed this was not hanging death, this was a manual strangulation. Now, of course, you know, you're going to be focusing on, on your suspect and you might or might not want to get a warrant for their arrest, depending on the circumstances. But I think he is allowed to eventually go back home. I think that same day, actually, he flew back to his daughters who were in Johannesburg. Um, and I guess then the case, you know, the, the, the detectives are doing the slog work, you know, mm. statements from people. Yes, there was an argument. I think they spoke to a, a security guy who saw them arguing the night before. That's an important statement because now you're looking at there were some issues. There was some fighting. Um, and you're trying to get all the little bits and pieces that help you strengthen your case to, to, to tell you what it looks like and confirm what it looks like. OK. Was the this, this second autopsy done because there was a yep. second autopsy. Was that done in this three-week period prior I, I to... Th yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, 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 you know, any individual or family of the deceased can request a couple of things. They can request at their own cost, of course, that a second forensic, forensic pathologist be present during the autopsy. Now, that's the best because then you are both seeing exactly the same thing. You can ask the pathologist to, to look something close or document that. Um, that's the best way. If you do ever want to have a second pathology uh, input, get them to attend the first autopsy. Okay. Here, what will happen is I think a day or two or three or four afterwards, um, Reggie Paramol, who um, used to be a forensic pathologist, if it's the same Paramol, uh, in, in, in KZN in Durban, a senior patho forensic pathologist, and then went private. Um, and he was asked to do a second autopsy. Now, the problem with the second autopsy, first, it's a couple of days later. You know, the body's not exactly in the same condition. Um, and, of course, it's not in the same condition at all because of the fact that you've done a complete autopsy. You've cut the whole chest open. You've done a bloodless nectar section, so you've opened up these areas. So you really, it's like... Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how to explain it in, in, in like an analogy, but you're doing an autopsy on a body that's been cut up already from the previous autopsy. So it's never, you're never in as good a position to give commentary on wounds and injuries um, because you're now dissecting a body that was already dissected, basically. So so what were Puramat's findings? Well, essentially, okay, so the, the forensic pathologist, Dr. Khan, who did the first autopsy, and I think mm. uh, Khan had her... Her, her manager, um, it was Dr. I always like to give credit to people who were there. Mm. Sorry, let me just check my notes. So Dr. Khan uh, had Dr. Was no, it? Oh, my goodness, I can't find it now. Doc, Dr. Jane um, New. Oh, Apologies. Anyway, but her, okay. her, her manager was also no, present, sorry, which was not a bad idea. Sorry. To get a second, yeah. second set of eyes is never a bad thing in these cases. And essentially what they said is that there's some old bruising of a couple of days, I think on her upper legs. There was other bruises, scratches, injuries on the body, blunt force kind of injuries, uh, but mainly that the cause of death was manual strangulation. A manual always refers to the hands. Okay. Ligature would be some kind of a rope or, or material that's used to strangle someone. So manual strangulation looks incredibly different to a hanging, hanging sort of uh, death and looks very different to strangling someone with a cord. You know, hanging deaths, there's always going to be that higher point where the rope is. And yeah. so the rope, the ligature has a very, you know, unique pattern of how it forms around your neck because of your body's going this way and the rope holding you up. Whereas if I'm strangling you with a piece of rope, the marks tend to be parallel because I'm pulling okay. this way. Okay. Uh, versus then hands where you literally get this bigger sort of set of pressure applied. You can literally sometimes see almost the bruising from the fingertips. Yeah. Very different uh, presentation from a forensic pathology point of view. And the doctor's like, nope, this was not what it looked like. This was definitely a um, manual strangulation. Someone strangled it with her hands, with his hands, his or her hands. Okay. You know, so, so when do the police get to the point where they feel like, and just generally speaking, in South Africa, kind of what, 
you know, what kind of what 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 kind of evidence do you need to have gathered? What you know to feel confident that okay, we can go so, and, so, and, and 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 do an arrest here. So I think the, the, it'll depend on case to case, but I think in this circumstances, you know, you've got um, the guy. He's found she's found dead in the bedroom that they were sharing. He was the last person, therefore, to have seen her. Um, he discovers the body, so to speak, or you know. You know, you're, you're going to be suspect number one of the, under those circumstances. Staging, mm -hmm. which is when you alter the crime scene to look like something else, is almost always done by someone who has a very, very strong motive to mislead the police from direct, misdirect the police away from themselves. It's almost always going to be a very close relation to the to the deceased. You know, boyfriend, husband, uh, roommate. No random person who breaks in and kills someone is going to, you know, spend the time hanging around the crime scene, just making it look like something else, because that's high risk for you. Yeah. You know, he himself says that they were in the room together. So did someone else climb in and strangle her to death? Okay. Um, how would they get that right? And he didn't wake up if that was genuinely the case. So I think once they've gotten the statements of other people talking about the argument, um, coming out about the allegations of the affair, you're probably going to be on a relatively safe footing. Now, of course, in this case, this is not someone who's going to easily disappear. He's a well-known figure. He's got children. He's a CEO of a company. So you're not worried about this guy really fleeing the scene. So, And you know he's going to get top-class lawyers. So you definitely want to wait until you're quite comfortable, quite ready. And then when you're ready, you go ahead and, say, and usually apply for a warrant of arrest uh, from the court and arrest the person, knowing that they're probably going to get you know, um, bail almost immediately um, pending the start of their trial. Okay, great. Um, what we'll do here, Gerard, is we'll just take a, a little two-second breather um, just, to, uh, just to do some admin. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of carry on post the arrest. So uh, just a reminder, guys, please, um, you know, we really want you to uh, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Hit that like button. Uh, please don't forget to um, engage with us throughout the show. We've, you know, we've got some great comments coming up. Uh, let's jump into a couple here. Forensic pathologists are crucial. I wish they would budget more for these specialists. They know what they need to look for. That's from MB. Um, Helen noticed me playing the wrong shot there. Sorry, Helen, but you got me. Um, and she says, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, Helen. We agree. Um, so please do. It really helps us to be able to kind of, you know, growing the community is really going to help us to be able to, um, to grow the channel as well. Um, we're also committed to bringing you the best. And we can also, you know, our commitment also extends to inviting you to contribute to the show on Patreon or to become a YouTube member as well. Um, we've been posting some, uh, we'll be posting and we have posted some, some exclusive content for you there for our members and super likes. If you want to drop us a super like, you can always do that. Um, also, um, plot shift is your go-to partner for uh, powerful storytelling and cutting edge production, whether you're looking <coughs> for commercial work or want to fund exciting local content, we're here to shift your perspective and, uh, help you go from what you should be doing to what you must be doing. Visit us at plotshift.co.za to explore what we can create together. Okay, great. Oh, well, you know, we're getting used to this live thing, eh, Gerard? Slowly but surely, we're getting used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so things have stacked up against yeah. Jason here. Um, yeah. uh, the arrest, he's arrested. Where do we go yeah. to post the arrest? What's yeah. kind of, what's the next important stage here? Okay, so obviously they're preparing, getting all the evidence, dot, what, crossing the T's, dotting the I's to make sure we're ready to go to trial. Uh, initially, it was handled by advocate Kareem Tennyson, an incredibly experienced prosecutor at the DPP's office in Cape Town, but due to a Conflict clashed, was given over to, uh, I think it was Louis, advocate Louis von Nickerk. Um, and he's eventually charged with murder and defeating the ends of justice. Uh, set down for trial in the Cape Town High Court, which often you'll see in the news, um, you know, the beautiful the old building. The, eventually the trial took 50, 57 days, um, 21 witnesses in total. The state called most of them. Uh, they actually went to the scene before the start of the trial. We'll call it inspection and local, which I really like and I wish courts would do that more often it's when the, the judge and the 
prosecution team, the defense team, the sus, the accused, all go and actually inspect where this mm. took place. That really changes your perspective on the evidence you're going to hear. You understand it far much, far better, and it doesn't often happen happen uh, in South Africa. It was before Judge uh, Sali Shlope, who was married to, um, I think, the judge president of the Western Cape, uh, Judge Shlope. <clears throat> and in terms of the defense witnesses, Jason Ruder testified. Now, uh, often the accused person does not testify in their trial. The law doesn't require you to. You have the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself. But also the court cannot make an adverse inference about the fact that you're not testifying. They can't say, well, you must be guilty. You must be hiding something. Um, but in, in cases where it's a one-on-one -on -one like this, you really do have to kind of get in there and say what happened from your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with Oscar. He had to get into that witness stand. There's no way he was going to be able to successfully get away with, you know, with that one without even trying that. So yeah. Jason Ruder testified. Uh, three experts, and I think uh, one of the people who was there that evening, uh, the morning, uh, testified. So, um, and what's interesting is, is, again, like I said in the beginning, how the, the, the state's witnesses, almost every single one of them, was, were highly regarded by the judge, seen as very credible, very reliable, specifically the, the state experts, and that's sometimes the most important. But his experts, which was basically... Uh, Dr. Paneri Peters, who's a well-known psychiatrist in Cape Town, uh, okay. uh, Dr. Perimo, Dr. Loftus, and I said, I can't, were, were the three ones, and they got a big, I mean, if you read the judgment, which is available, this is not skin, skin, skinnering or gossip. They were really hammered by the judge. Okay. I just want, just a quick one um, to Carmen. Let's pull this one up. Here we go. Carmen has dropped us a super chat. Thank you very much, Carmen. You've jumped right to the top of our... I'm sorry, I'm going to make this bigger here in the middle. There we go. Uh, Carmen has dropped us a super chat. She dropped straight to the front of our... We like you, Carmen. List. Thank you very much. And uh, Ashley says, thoroughly enjoying these lives. Keep up the good work, gents. We will certainly endeavor to do that. Um, so what is it? I mean, what did these guys get dragged over the coals for by the judge? So, so let's judge quickly just skip... Do yeah. what the prosecution's witness. So they called uh, Mark Thompson, okay. who's a co-worker. He did CPR for about 45 minutes. He noticed bruising around the neck, uh, and which he thought, that's kind of weird. This is a very thin cord, but of course, that's not an expert opinion. Dr. Khan, who was a pathologist, was at the scene by 12.45 that day. He saw scratch marks on the neck and the jaw, blunt force trauma to the left eye socket consistent with the fist wearing a ring, uh, blood spatter on the right upper eyelid, bruising on the left knee and lower leg, healing bruises on the upper right leg and thighs and was concerned about, you know, uh, domestic violence, abrasion consistent with being dragged on a rough surface like a carpet, um, defense injuries on her hands, uh, fecal matter between the buttocks, blood stains on the pillow, bed sheet, duvet. The ligature mark was horizontal. Remember what I said earlier, not consistent with hanging, which has an upwards mark. Yeah. Um, and the underlying hemorrhages didn't or in a different location to where the ligature was geographically, blood in her stomach, which means there must have been some bleeding somewhere in the, in the, in the mouth, nose, etc. And, and urine was tested negative for drugs. So that was Dr. Khan. So that's very damning stuff that's not fitting the scenario. We had a cell phone expert, Warrant Officer Engelbrecht. Then we had another cell phone expert, Annemarie van Niekerk, who really was regarded as a very credible uh, witness in terms of what she analyzed, the messages, the, the interaction between everybody. They were able to recover some of the deceased, the deleted WhatsApp messages, etc. cetera. Um, then the psychologist who had been her therapist, the deceased therapist, uh, said that she'd been seeing her since May. So in other words, basically two months before the murder, uh, had eight sessions that there's no evidence. There was no violence, but they did have fierce arguments. Um, that they had couples counseling, um, didn't experience her as being suicidal in their conversations. Remember, she also had WhatsApp chats with the deceased the night before she was found dead and said she didn't have any major serious uh, psycho psychiatric issues. Um, uh, they called the marriage counselor, though she was not a psychologist. She was a marriage counselor, so evidence was a bit limited. Uh, another Dr. Stienkamp, who was a medical practitioner, Dr. Abrahams, who was, sorry, that was the other doctor, the senior to Dr. Okay. Khan, who also came, okay. she was present and watched the, the autopsy. Marius Joubert, I said that very well-known captain from forensics, who's an excellent crime scene guy. Daniels, who opened the door, we saw his statement earlier. And then the police engineer who spoke about, would such a cord have held up to her weight? Would it have been stretched? 
uh, and, and all those people were essentially regarded as reliable, trustworthy, evidence is accepted. Those are the main witnesses for the state. So Perimol basically says, nope, this was a, this was a ligature kind of wounds and indicative of hanging. Uh, the other pathologist, Loftus, pretty much said the same thing, that this was more indicative of hanging. Um, okay. Paneri Peter, basically, she seemed to have an incredibly broad mandate, if I looked at the judgment. You know, she was, like, um, told to do a psychological autopsy on, into her, to look, to look at Jason Ruder, and look at anything else that might be relevant. And it's like, you don't really normally want, you want a clear instruction from, you, from your inst attorneys instructing you. This seems to be like, go and do whatever. And, you know, my question would be, you're, you're doing multiple different things that, although they're all forensic, they kind of sound like it's not a good idea for you to be doing all of those different things. What, um, would, what would a specific instruction like that sound like then? Like, what kind, of, what kind of instructions have you been given, for example? Well, I would have sort of said, would say, well, what's the most important thing for me? I would have said to these attorneys that they contacted me, I said, look, probably the most important thing right now, because this is a question, was it a murder or a suicide? is we want to do the psychological autopsy. I think that's a very valid thing to have done. The state should have actually got one of these done. To say, but are there signs and indications of someone who was depressed, who was suicidal? Mm -hmm. um, does a does psychological state of mind in the weeks, months, weeks, days, nights before leading up to this match someone who would have then wanted to commit suicide? Mm -hmm. um, that's actually what should have been done. And you, the, the, the therapist can't do that. They can't step out of their therapy role and do a forensic assessment. In fact, you'll get into big trouble with the whole professions council if you mix those two roles of therapist and independent expert, forensic expert witness. You will get into big trouble. Um, so, but then to sort of say like, well, kind of look at anything that could be relevant. It's like, no, that's not how it works. You're not there on a fishing expedition. Um, and actually the court, once when Paneri Peter was testifying, um, the, she did the sort of psychological autopsy part, I think, and then she started to comment on Ruder, and the judge actually stopped her, and this is very, very unusual. The judge actually stopped her and said, the rest of your evidence I'm not going to allow you to present, because it was basically trying to talk about the credibility of Jason Ruder's evidence. An expert witness can never comment on the credibility of a witness or try and boost up their evidence and say, but the, this is believable, because um, the judge is the one who's supposed to evaluate people's evidence. Um, so the judge said, what you're doing now, you're, you're taking over the court's role. I'm not going to allow it. And that's a, as an expert, you should also have known that's what you're doing. Um, so the judge took the very unusual step of stopping her after she got to finish some of her evidence. And like I said, when we got to the evaluation of the evidence, her and Loftus and, uh, Perimol, I mean, as I said, I can, we can read some of the snippets here and it's mm. really, yeah, it's, yeah, let's... they've almost. Destroyed, potentially destroyed careers. That's kind of where we're looking at. Let's do that. I mean, give us a little bit. Of, give us a highlight. Give us some of the, the highlights right. there. Yeah, quickly, the low, my, low lights. Um, per, this is now uh, Dr. Perimol with the second autopsy. Mm. Perimol's risk, mm. risk representation of the deceased's injuries, starting with his report dates on the 1st of August 2016, tended both in the bail, bail proceedings and before this court resonates with the ever-increasing phenomenon that certain experts tend to protect the interests of the group that hired them. Experts some, sometimes tend to suffer from the quest to help find facts beneficial to the commissioning party, in other words, the people that contracted them, um, and similarly conceal those features which would point to the latter's guilt. In, es in essence, you're a hired gun, you're being biased. I continue. Okay. That being said, I need to state that not every expert hired by a party can be labeled a hired gun, the same how it can, however, not be said of Dr. Perimol. That is yeah. absolutely damning for your future prospects of ever testifying in court. Because if, the, if a high court judge has found you to be a hired gun, tailoring your evidence, misleading the courts, that's a credibility finding that sticks with you forever. Yeah. So I would be very curious to see. Um, thing. And he goes on to talk about Dr. Loftus, who was the other pathologist, misrepresented to the court that he had done a digital or virtual autopsy. I don't know what the hell that is, and gave his comments <laughs> and conclusions accordingly. When the matter reconvened after the July recess, the court engaged Dr. Lo Dr. Loftus on the fact that the notion of his having performed a digital autopsy was clearly misleading. However, he refused to concede this to be the case and continued to insist that the autopsy was performed, he performed was virtual. This is quite clearly incorrect. So you are lying to the court. Um, he testified that on... <laughs> 
Loftus testified that after taking everything into account, he believed that beyond a reasonable doubt, the deceased on that morning hanged herself in the bathroom. Um, and the judge then goes on to slam him to saying, but hang on a minute, using words like reasonable doubt, you're trying to be the judge. You're trying to be the, take over the role of the court. And he gets lambasted for trying to take over what the court is the one which is supposed to be doing, which is making findings beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so those are the two pathologists who really got a tongue lashing of note. Um, Paneri Peter, the psychiatrist, as I said, also got, um, got some choice words. I want to go to page two to four of the judgments where if you want to read this again, as I said, it's available for everybody to read. This is public information. I'm not slandering someone. This is the judge quoting this. Um, this is referring to Dr. Paneri Peter. In these circumstances, I am of the view that the report by Dr. Paneri Peter is inadmissible. That's bad news. It's worthy of mention that even if I'm wrong on any one of the reasons aforesaid for not accepting this report, and if indeed the deceased was a suicidal risk, this would not mean that the death of the deceased was as a result of suicide. The evidence as a whole must be, must be determined to, so as to support such a finding. And I want to just see, there's one more other little quick spots where the judge was quite... Um, Okay, uh, Paneri Peter's evaluation in inverted comments of the version of the accused. This is when she's commenting on Jason Ruder's testimony. Mm. And her pronouncement of the probabilities thereof is not only an attempt to usurp the, an ex the exclusive role and function of the court to do so, it amounts to the modern day version of an oath helper, which is a 12th century English um, court system where you basically bring people to say how wonderful you are and how truthful you yeah. are, etc. Um, so basically, again, those three experts had a really rough time, um, and it did not go well. And as I said, the, the logical conclusion at the end of this was that the court found beyond a reasonable doubt that this was a murder and that Jason Ruder was responsible uh, therefore. Mm. So the judge eventually, in terms of the sentencing, um, gave 20 years for the murder and a you're trying to think how many years for the defeating the ends of justice but it's almost almost inconsequential because it, it wouldn't affect things yeah just a simple point when we talk about the court made the judgment could you know i think a lot of folks again maybe outside of south africa or what have you in, in, in the likes of, of the usa you know maybe thinking that there's a jury sitting here um who is the who is yeah. the court? Just to so, clarify so for people, is based on kind of English law, which of course the American system is based on the English style of system. You've got a prosecution that calls witnesses, you cross examine them. The defense then has their turn; they can call witnesses, and, and the prosecution can cross examine them. And in different parts of the world, you'll have then the judge or a jury in the U.S. Very often that makes the findings of guilty or not. So up until 1969, we had juries in South Africa, and then they did away with them, partly because of our apartheid system. The juries were all white. Imagine that if you have a black accused person. And now it's the judge. We still have the same concept of the prosecution presenting the case with cross-examination by the other side, and etc. But it is the judge sitting there or the magistrate, they serve based on the same function, um, that makes a de decision on guilt or innocence. And of course, would also then make a, the decision guided by case law and, and statute for sentencing. So the court, when I say the court in this case, it was Judge Sali Shlopi. I don't think she had an assessor sitting with her. I don't think that's mentioned anywhere. So she would be the one to decide on everything. If there's a challenge towards the admissibility of a piece of evidence, that would be presented and dealt with in a trial within a trial in front of that same judge. So really the judge is in charge of everything and makes the final decision on guilt or innocence and ultimately the sentence. And so Jason was found guilty and sentenced to? 20 years for the murder, which I think for a spontaneous murder, because I don't think there's any indications that he planned to do this, you know, a day before, a week before, a month before, it would have been a spontaneous murder that kind of was born out of the arguments and how things unfolded that night. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean the court still might not make it a premeditated murder, um, but it's in this case, I think the judge clearly didn't think it was premeditated. Um, Otherwise, you would have got a life sentence. That's the minimum sentence for a premeditated murder. And the judge gave him 20. Now, normally for a non-premeditated murder, the starting point is 15 years. <clears throat> and I would like to say that, well, I can say that from my own experience of intimate partner murders that are not premeditated, 
typically 12 to 15 is kind of the spectrum that I often see, whether we agree with that or not, it's the second issue. Mm. So 20 was quite steep, actually. I think probably aggravated by the, the, the fact that he tried to alter the crime scene. He did appeal that. The courts, the, the, the appeal court still found him, you know, that he's guilty. Um, but Or they dismissed his appeal on this guilty verdict. And they did lower the sentence to 15 years, which, as like I said now, I'm not really surprised by that. If I look at other people who have been found guilty of kind of pretty much the same thing, I probably would have expected 15 years. As I said, we can all feel differently about whether someone should get life every time you kill someone. But what we feel and what the courts do, you know, are two separate things. And, and you can give a really outlandish sentence. It's just going to be knocked down on appeal. So yeah. I think pushing the ice limits for 20 years and the appeal court eventually downgraded it to uh, 15 years, which means, of course, halfway through, he will be eligible for parole hearings. And if he's been well behaved in the sort of seven and a half years, I mean, when I'm not even sure, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see when this judgment was given. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking. Uh, I have to scroll back to the top of the top of the of the 250 pages. So he might even be actually ready for parole. Yeah, this was exactly. delivered on the November 8th of November, 2018. So. Add seven and a half years, so seven years would be 2025. So probably halfway through next year or early 2026, he would be eligible for parole. Okay. Well, maybe we can look into that and uh, give an update in a, in a, in a later episode. Um, okay, so, uh, so he certainly didn't get away with it. That's certainly the case. And um, like you say, I mean, some very interesting... It's very interesting to to kind of consider the fact that the judge is not the judge's role is not necessarily just to cast judgment on the accused in a sense. It's you know he's going to look at the evidence, he's going to assess and evaluate all of the people that are presented by the defense and the prosecution, and if he needs to call out aspects of of that component of the case, then he will do so. He'll extend yep. his judgment beyond just the accused, yep. which is super interesting. And what's What's very nice compared to a jury system, because as I understand the jury system, you know, the, the chairperson of the jury stands up and what's your verdict? We find you guilty. But they don't go into what's the reasons. But here, at least our judgments, you can clearly see how the judge came to that conclusion. What pieces of evidence they found yeah. weighty enough <clears throat> to convince them beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's really cool about the way our judgments are done. And look, he yeah. was represented by Advocate Graham from the Spay. A highly qualified, very experienced uh, criminal, uh, well, does criminal work. I'm sure he does other work. I mean, I myself, when I was still test in, in, in the police and I was testifying in a case where an orthopedic surgeon was convicted of fiddling with the number of his patients and I was an expert witness for the prosecution, um, I was cross-examined by Graham von Espey and it was probably one of the most unpleasant cross-examinations I've ever had. He's a real tenacity bulldog. So, you know, it wasn't like he had bad legal representation, he had top-notch legal representation, but they're also a very good prosecutor and a very, very experienced judge. So, um, and that's what you want. You don't ever want someone be, to be represented badly uh, in a yeah. case. You really want to make sure that when the final verdict is given, it was really properly tested. The evidence was scrutinized from both sides and a good, good, well-founded judgment is, is made. Yeah. Whether okay, it's well, guilty or no, it doesn't matter. You know, as is kind of becoming a... Uh, 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 tradition on the show we've gone a little bit over nine o'clock guys if you want to the premiere episode of true crime room with derek Riedler will be uh, will be playing out now but that will of course be on the channel for you to take a look at tonight talking about a very interesting case of of, of a staged mooty murder if you're not familiar with what mooty murder is um very worth very well worthwhile checking that out but i just to kind of wrap up this question i i've often I've come to be of the opinion, and, I've, and I'm curious to, well, I've come to have this thought, and I'm curious to know your opinion on it, is that, you know, when it comes to murder, yes, all murder is bad, okay? But now you've got someone like Jason Rhodes, who's a guy who's in a relationship that he, you know, is, is not going great. He's got a, he's got a girlfriend. It's, there's kind of marital distress. And instead of, I don't know, getting a divorce and, you know, moving out and carrying on with his life, he chooses this path. Now, mm -hmm. if I compare somebody doing that to a, a psychopath, a serial killer, now not to make a, you know, a serial killer who is 
literally, you know, got some very, very strange um, tastes and, and is, you know, how do I put it? Is, um, you know, has a natural instinct to want to murder. I've always kind of, I've kind of come to be of the opinion that I, I have hold more disdain for somebody like Jason than for somebody who has kind of got a, a, a possibly a psychological condition that is kind of they're predisposed to murder as opposed to yeah. somebody like Jason who just seems to be a bit of a coward trying to get out of a relationship that in the worst possible way yeah yeah look I mean I've often said that you know in a way if one if one if there was a death penalty do I think serial murderers should be subject to it part of me says no to be honest with you, because I don't think we know, we do, I don't think they understand why they get these urges and have these desires. I don't think we understand why they get these urges and have these desires. Whereas Jason Rudd, it was anger. And, mm. and I don't think he planned to kill her so he can get her out the way so he can have the new relationship. I think what probably happened there was, was out of an over a buildup of, of, of explosion of emotions and he lost okay. it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, unfortunately lost it in a way that, cause the bloody death of another human being at literally at their hands yeah. so yeah i mean they're, they're definitely different types of people and i do think they should be in some way seen differently and maybe judged differently i don't know i don't know i'm just talking in circles here but yeah. you know that he had he had other options you know what i mean that's he could, what, like kind of what said, i that's what i mean kind of thing, yeah. i can just say to my i'm getting divorced and i'll go through that pain and suffering i will still be able to see my children I still have a great job. Yes, I'll have to pay some maintenance and I can have my new relationship with my new partner. That was very much an option. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, Jason, uh, you know, I don't think any of us are going to be signing up for the Jason Roder fan club. And I don't throw any look up. Personally, I feel like it's a bit of a, for murder, it seems like a pretty thin sentence, you know, to, for somebody to be out just, a handful of years later doesn't feel entirely like justice, but that's how the system works. And at least what you've got here is some great, great police work happening around the actual incident. And then some equally detailed and thorough work over the course of the, of, of the uh, trial as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, what you can really take a lot of kind of um, comfort out of is that, you know, we, when the system works, it really works well. And I often feel that in South Africa, you know, the police get a bad rap and the justice system gets a bad rap. And yes, there are pro problems at lots of levels. But, you know, we should really call out and celebrate the excellence that does exist, yeah. you know, within the yep. system as well. Um, and the more we recognize it, the maybe the more people will be in, you know, more, the more the, the decision makers will be encouraged to, yeah. to you know, to, to, I, to continue down that path. My, my view is always that if you really care about something like the police, like the justice system, you don't cover up their mistakes. You call them out when mistakes are made. It's like a child. If you always cover up for your child when they're doing something wrong and you never punish them and there's never consequences, you're going to grow up with a psychopathic child. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. Re call out the good stuff and reward those people with whatever. Um, but just as much when the people mess things up, that must never be covered up. We cannot afford to have that. We will destroy our justice system and police faster if we don't. So when I criticize the police, and I do that fairly often, it's actually not coming from a place of, oh, I don't like the cops, they're useless. It's a case of, I want this to become, get back to being this amazing organization that it was once in terms of its investigative capabilities. Yeah. Same thing with the prosecutions. Um, because if we just let that stuff slide and make excuses and cover it up, we are pushing it down that hill even faster. Yeah. You wouldn't have these opinions if you didn't care. Um, all right, let's just, to, I think we can wrap up. Um, I'd love to just take, go to a few comments and questions uh, yeah. quickly before we go. So we've got MB here. The worst thing um, the accused can do is to testify, in my opinion. They always shoot themselves in the foot, proverbially speaking. <laughs> what are your thoughts there? Yeah. MB, you're absolutely right. Uh, lawyers hate putting their clients in the witness stand because they usually they they get overwhelmed they get emotional they say the wrong thing they get they screw their case over royally but any defense lawyer dreads having to put their client in the witness stand uh sometimes you don't have a choice like i said in this case you you probably as i said there's no law that says you must 
but you kind of, in this case, probably didn't have much of a choice. You, he had to get there and say what happened. Same with, like I said, with Oscar Pistorius. He was the only other person there. He has to explain what he was doing and what happened and what his version of events is. His version of events can't be presented by his lawyer. It has to be done by him. Otherwise, it's not evidence that can be tested in court. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I can imagine, specifically if you have like, I mean, imagine Donald Trump. I can imagine his lawyers are like, oh my goodness, I don't want him to get into the witness stand because his buttons can be easily pushed. I'm just... Please don't, don't, let's not have a Trump mugger issue yet, but I'm just giving that as a quick example. It's so a if you have good someone who's self-centered, who's arrogant, who's, and that's why lawyers are the worst to be in the witness stand. Mm. They are the worst witnesses ever because okay. they're not used to being on the other side, not that side. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely you don't want to do that ever unless you have absolutely no bloody choice. Okay. Tanya, why do some experts testify in such a manner knowing they're violating their ethical code? Because, I mean, this is a part of, I imagine these are pretty early lectures. Hey? Yeah. You know, Tanya, I, I, phenomenal because it's often not newbie people. You know, if it's a newbie who's not done this before, you can understand why they get themselves into a nickel and a knot and get say the wrong things. These were highly experienced people. These were not noobs. Um, so it's really interesting. And, and I, you know, on the one hand, the hired gun is like the person who's paid to say, whatever they're hired to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and the court, of course, use that analogy with some of these cases and the witnesses here. I do think in these high profile cases, specifically if you're charging a lot of money, there's almost this inclination that you want to give the people what they want to hear. So it's a very, you, you, and it's just, it, it, I don't know why. And we saw that also with the Oscar Pistorius case where some experts came up and, and for the for Oscar's case and, and just got shot down, annihilated completely. And I don't know why. I mean, you know, it's your reputation that's up there. Um, you know, I've turned down so much work because I could feel that the lawyers wanted me to say what they wanted me to say. And I'm like, I'm not interested in working with this lawyer. I don't do it. And I make it very clear from the start. I'll give you my opinion. Not my problem if it doesn't suit your client. You don't have to call me as an expert, as a witness, but you're going to pay me for my assessment. Mm. Um, and I get a lot of, you know, ad ad attorneys that don't phone me back. And I'm quite happy with that because I don't want to work with attorneys who are going to try and expect me to say something. Um, so you, every, time you do, every time you do an assessment, you really just have to keep that in mind that have I been objective? Have I, have I looked at all factors, all explanations and come there by the by sort of exclusion of all the other options to this particular one? Can I justify it through the science of my profession? But I just see it so often. And it's often very experienced people the ones with the big fancy names and it makes me wonder how long have you been doing this kind of quality of work if this is what i'm seeing by so-called experts in the courtroom psychology is what obviously the, the, i encounter that the most and i can tell you some very big names in my profession it's just repeatedly do disgusting work there's no other word to describe it in court in courtrooms okay well um there you go that's i hope that answers your question um and then how would parole work just helen i I think, Helen, it would be a good idea to jump back. We've had some very in-depth discussions on the parole system. Jared has lots of uh, strong and, and very interesting opinions. And it's very interesting to understand how the parole system works. There's an, uh, one of the previous podcasts we did, I think it's titled uh, Get Out Jail Free Card, something along those lines. Take a listen back to that. But we'll definitely, it's something that we talk about. And if you can maybe just do a quick... Um, you know, just a little, uh, a two-minuter on the parole system for Helen there, Jared. Like Helen, that's a phenomenal question. Like Paul said, we can speak for hours, and the parole mm -hmm. system needs to be reformed, absolutely. Essentially, what is parole? It's a Parole is when you release a person before their full length of sentence has expired. And the purpose of it is actually very important, because if you, say, sentence them for 10 years, and you keep them in jail for 10 years, when they hit that 10-year period, they can walk out of that jail and go, bye, we can't control them, we can't monitor them, we can't follow up on them, we can't place restrictions on them. They literally walk out. And that's a recipe for disaster. Parole is, about, is, is kind of like, let's let you out under very strict conditions and test how it goes. You know, you can't drink alcohol, you can't go out at night. You have to stay with someone who's prepared to take you in. You can only go to church, you can get a job, you've got to report three times a week, you've got to go and do these courses with correctional services, community, community corrections. So we can impose those conditions. It's almost like putting guidelines to help the person reintegrate back into society. That's absolutely important. Do I think it should happen halfway through your bloody sentence? Potentially, no. <clears throat> so if it's not a life sentence, halfway through, they call it the minimum detention period, halfway through your sentence, over here between my thumbs, 
you then start to have parole hearings. If you don't get it the first time, you'll have a parole hearing maybe a year later, 18 months later, and eventually and most likely you will get parole before the expir expiration of your actual sentence. With a life sentence, it's at the 25-year point in time. That's the short version. Yeah. <clears throat> and Helen, if you, if you look back over the, uh, the 90s and the early 2000s in particular, when uh, Mickey Pasturius, who we spoke to last night, and then Gerard was coming into his role in the police, there were a lot of very bad people locked up in that period. And they are very much, you know, even if they were given a 25-year sentence, are very much at the end of their, their kind of sentences or in the parole space. And yep. so, um, you know, unfortunately, there's, you know, a mountain of news when it comes to, to, to crime and, and what have you in South Africa. So some of it gets possibly lost in the, uh, you know, yeah, lost in the lost in that a, a bit. But I mean, it's certainly something that we talk about and we'll talk about cases in the future where that is the where that is the case where, you know, certain people that we've discussed in the podcast previously that Gerard would tell you should never be released back into public are out there walking amongst us. So, um, so it is a very interesting reality and something to that. Yeah. We like to talk about on the podcast. Well, guys, thank you so much to everyone. MB, Helen, Chris Dippenau. Thank you to Chris. Um, I agree, Chris, like, like, like we want to, we want those likes and, uh, hit the subscribe button as well. Obviously the pod, you know, this discussion, it will go live straight after the episode. So please also just make sure you share it with your friends, share it far and wide. Um, you know, the bigger the community, like we always say, the better we can help out. So Jared, um, I mean, uh, uh, final thought on the case. Um, you know, sadly, intimate partner murder is not uncommon in South Africa. A lot of women are murdered by current or former intimate partners. Um, so it's a sad reality of our country. It already has a very high crime rate. This is you're, you're very likely to die at the hands of a current or former intimate partner. So sad because I always feel it's like so unnecessary. It's purely out of anger. And so, like we said just now, so unnecessary. People can go their separate ways. Um, and if someone wants to let them go, if that person wants to go, then they're not the right person for you. And this thing about these guys who want to cling and keep, I mean, not, this is not the case in Jason's scenario. Just, um, yeah, it's, it's just very, it's, it's all avoidable, to be honest with you. It's absolutely, absolutely. avoidable. Okay. Carmen is currently completing her M1 in clinical psych and has an interest in forensics. Hearing that her two heroes, Gerard and Mickey, are collaborating on an episode. Sounds like Christmas has come early. And yes, it is a... A very interesting discussion. I was very much an audience member on that one myself. So I'll be joining you to watch it again. And when we post Paul, it. it's, it's coming out on Christmas Eve, isn't it? No, the week before. The, seven, the 17th is the seventeenth. will be the Mickey discussion. And then the 24th, Christmas yeah, Eve, we're with, we're with retired Lieutenant Colonel Jan DeLange talking about the Anisha van Nieko case. Yeah. But thank you, Gerard. Um, guys, we'll be back next week. Um, if you haven't already, please make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Join the conversation by commenting uh, or sharing this video with a friend or even better, all your friends. Don't forget to click the notification bell so you're always up to date on new content. If you want to support the show and get access to exclusive content, check out our Patreon page where you can contribute to the podcast success and just have to search Profiler Africa or become a member right here on YouTube for perks like exclusive footage and more. Um, next week, we'll be diving into another great case. Don't forget that um, coming up, we have those great episodes that we've mentioned. Subscribe, like, hit the notification bell, like we say. Uh, thank you so much, Jared. I, I, you know, I'm really starting to enjoy our Tuesday nights together. I'm starting to forget what Tuesday nights was like without you. Oh, and, okay. um and it was a dark time in my life, Gerard, but we're, you know, we're <laughs> together here from 8 to 9 every Tuesday. We'll be back again next week. Thank you so much, Gerard. Um, thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to everyone for joining the chat. Thank you to Fred and to Bax and to, of course, Amy. Um, this has been Profiler. And guys, don't forget to keep looking over your shoulder. Bye, Gerard. Yes, guys. Bye-bye, everybody. I am a human being and I kill human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. 
Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion, Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about.